Welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions. This seminar series is hosted by the NSF-funded Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry. The goal of the seminar series is, as always, to bring the community together. The seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Eastern. They are also available to watch anytime on the YouTube channel. On the YouTube channel, you also have access to all of our previous seminar speakers, all of which are shown here. We also have a great group of speakers lined up for the upcoming months that we hope you will join us for all of them. Before we get started, a great big thanks to a few folks. First, Dr. James Batiste, the Center Director, Jennifer Belsick, the Center's Administrative Coordinator, and two CMCC students without whom the seminar would not be possible, Quintarius Moore and Katie Floyd. Thank you ahead of time for joining us. Uh, please do subscribe and follow us on the YouTube channel, CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussions, as well as on Twitter. A quick reminder that this seminar is being recorded. If you have questions, you can either email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com or post them directly into the YouTube channel. Either way, they will be propagated to the speaker at the end of the presentation. Now, last but not least, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Danielle Lawrenson. Dr. Lawrenson is a CNRS, CNRS researcher at the Institute Charles Gerhardt in Montpellier, France. She received her PhD in 2006 from University Pierre at Marie Curie in Paris in the field of inorganic chemistry. She then performed a two-year postdoc at the University of Warwick in the UK, during which she worked on characterization of substituted appetites by solid state NMR. She was then recruited at the CNRS in 2009 and was awarded the CNRS Bronze Medal in 2013. Her current research activities are at the interface of synthetic chemistry and solid state NMR, with particular focus on developing new O-labeling schemes using mechanochemistry and studying the structure of calcium phosphate biomaterials by solid state NMR. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Danielle Lawrenson. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to share with you today some of the work we've been performing in Montpellier, France, trying to understand a bit better reaction mechanisms in bois milling. And before I get started, I really wish to acknowledge the collective work made by the whole group in Montpellier involving both permanent staff and current and former students who have been studying together with me different aspects of these mechanochemistry reactions. So just to give a bit of background, as synthetic chemists, when we try to synthesize complex biological materials, molecular materials, or biomolecules, the question we have very often is how to proceed. And most frequently, we go through standard synthetic groups, which involves solution-based chemistry. These are carried out using standard glassware or hydrothermal reactors, for example. More problematically, in most cases, they can involve toxic organic solvents, and these can also be polluting. So in a general search for more environmentally friendly uh, synthetic approaches of biomolecules, molecular materials, or even metal complexes, chemists have been looking to ways in reducing solvent consumption as well as chemical waste. And one of the synthetic approaches which has been brought forward for this is mechanochemistry. So very briefly speaking, in bois milling, we generally start from solid reagents, which are introduced in a reactor in presence of beads. The medium is ground at several tens of hertz, which allows for an efficient mixing of the reactant particles, a reduction in the particle size, and it also allows reactions to proceed at the interfaces of the particles. And because of the absence of bulk solvent at the synthetic step, so these procedures are brought forward as generally being less toxic and less polluting. But also this absence of solvent increases 
in theory, the concentration of the reagents within the medium and hence the kinetics of some of the reactions taking place. So this is overall very attractive and it has been used for the synthesis of some of the compounds mentioned previously, but also other types of systems such as molecular crystals and co-crystals. The other attractive features of bromelain is that it leads to possible improvements in reactivity and selectivity. It can lead to novel molecules and materials compared to those achieved generally in solution. And it can also be considered as rather straightforward to implement in different laboratories. And this is why a large number of molecules and materials are currently being studied and synthesized by this technique. However, there is a catch. When you think about these reactions, they are generally performed in wall mills, such as the one represented here, which involve these opaque milling jars made of stainless steel, PTFE, or zirconia, just to give a few examples. And so if you want to understand what's going on inside the jar, well, one of the standard approaches is to mix the reagent, perform the ball milling, open the jar, and then perform an analysis of the reacting mixture using techniques such as infrared spectroscopy, powder X-ray diffraction, or NMR spectroscopy. And depending on the result of the analysis, decide whether the reaction is finished or whether it is unsuccessful or incomplete. And potentially, if it is incomplete, start the milling again for a certain amount of time and recharacterize the mixture. And generally speaking, it has been shown that because we are working in the solid state, the reactivity, which is known in solution, isn't always as straightforward when we're carrying out reactions in ball milling. So there is a real need to try to understand in more detail what is going on inside these milling jars to be able to have a better control of the outcome of the reactions. And so to answer these questions, different groups have been trying to push forward different methods to be able to understand the outcome of mechanical chemical reactions. One way of working is to proceed towards instrumental developments with in situ or operando analysis, which allow us to study in real time what's going on inside the jars, for example, through Raman spectroscopy, powder X-ray diffraction analysis, or temperature measurements. Another approach has been to understand what's going on by designing chemical reactions, which will allow us to identify at the atomic level, the different processes taking place. And in particular, there have been a few examples involving isotopic labeling, which allow you to understand a little bit better the different changes in bonding environments occurring between the reacting particles. And lastly, we can't forget the help of computational modeling in, in these approaches to, uh, to understand better um, the reactivity of different types of molecules or materials at interfaces. In Montpellier, we've mainly been focusing on the two first aspects, instrumental developments and synthetic chemistry approaches. And for today, I decided just to highlight two examples along these lines. And we will start off with a part on the oxygen-17 isotopic labeling work we've been carrying out. And this was essentially achieved by a former postdoc, Ch Chashin Fen, uh, who had worked in the group on this topic, studying the reactivity of oxides. So let's look into a given system, which would be the, the synthesis of functional uh, inorganic materials of the family of apatites, perovskites, zeolites, or layered hydroxides or layered oxides. When you look at some of the synthetic protocols used in the literature for these compounds, they proceed by a pre-mixing of solid reagents, sometimes using a mortar and pestle, other times using mechanochemistry. And then these solid reagents are heat treated at high temperature to produce a final ceramic, or in other cases, a glass. Now, the question you may ask is what's actually happening during this pre-mixing step? Is there any optimization which could be carried out here? And what is happening between the reacting particles you've introduced within your milling jar, whether it is a standard mixer mill or a planetary mill in some cases? <clears throat> so in other words, if you imagine you are mixing two oxide particles, MOX and M'OY, for example, 
Are you simply doing a physical mixing of the two, bringing them close in space? Or are you creating an interface between the two particles? And in most cases, it is analysis through powder X-ray diffraction, which have been used so far to study reaction media at this step, which generally show that there are changes in crystalline phases or not. So it's basically an analysis of what are the crystalline phases present. However, if you want to understand in more detail whether there are interfaces created, perhaps you would like to study the oxygen local environment within these systems after the pre-mixing step. If you're talking about local environments, then that would mean studying them, for example, using oxygen-17 and the Mars spectroscopy. So let's talk a bit about oxygen-17 and MR. For those of you who are not familiar, oxygen-17 is the only stable isotope of oxygen to have a nuclear spin, which is not equal to zero. So it's the only one you can study by NMR. And it turns out that this is a very valuable technique. It has a huge range of chemical shifts, which exceeds 1,000 ppm, compared to proton NMR, which is approximately 10 ppm. And also, because it is a quadrupolar nucleus with a spin 5 here, you can also measure quadrupolar parameters, which will inform you about the local environment of this atom. Then, just to illustrate the importance of using O17 NMR and the characterization, for example, of oxides, you have here the chemical shift range for oxygen and different types of oxides, depending on, the, on the type of atoms it is bound to. So typically, if you have a siloxane, it will come out just below 100 ppm. If you have oxygen bound to titania, the chemical shift can spread over several hundreds of ppm, depending on the number of titanium atoms directly linked to the oxygen. And this is the range for zirconia. And here you have the SiOTI bridges, which come out. So the chemical shift range is potentially huge, huge, and it can inform and very subtle changes in the local environment of this atom. And this is why it has been applied for the study of various different materials and nanomaterials, as illustrated here in an investigation of different nanocrystals using high-resolution oxygen-17 NMR spectroscopy, showing different signatures depending on the crystal uh, nanocrystal investigation. So potentially it's a very powerful technique, but there's a catch once more, the natural abundance, only 0.04%. Because of this, if you're performing your analysis on a molecule or a material you're just taking out from the, from the lab, well, it is likely you will not get any signal during the analysis. This is an example just on a bisboronic acid, 30 milligrams of compound approximately, which was analyzed overnight on our 600 megahertz instrument. And this is what you get. If you want to be able to counter this, you have to perform isotopic labeling. And typically, using an O17 labeled compound, this is what you would get in just a few hours uh, on, on our instrument. It turns out that O17 labeling can actually be performed using mechanochemistry by introducing a very small amount of O17 enriched water during the milling process, just a few microliters. And we've shown that this can be applied for the enrichment of oxide and hydroxides, but also hydrates, as well as a series of organic molecules. And I'll give a few examples of this later on in this presentation. So it is possible to perform analysis using O17 NMR, provided that we are labeled. So if we go back to our question here, if we want to study the mixing of two reagents, and in particular probe and investigate whether any changes are occurring at the interfaces between the reacting particles, well, we will need to perform O17 label. And so for today, I'll just give one example on the mixing of two types of particles, titania and silica. The titania was introduced as a crystalline form, anatase, and as a silica precursor, it was an amorphous form, aerosol, which was used. And because both of these need to be enriched in O17 in order to study the interface between the two, I will first focus on the labeling step of each of these phases separately. So as mentioned previously, we can actually perform the isotopic labeling of metal oxides using mechanochemistry. You start from your oxide, you add one equivalent of isotopically enriched water and perform the ball milling. Here you'll have the, on the left, the results for the aerosol and on the right, those for the anatase. 
And before we performed any O17 NMR analysis on the final material, we first characterized it by a series of techniques. And you have a comparison of first the X-ray diffraction powder patterns before and after one hour of milling for titania on this side and silica on the other. And there are no significant changes in powder X-ray diffraction. We remain amorphous in the case of the aerosol, and we have no new uh, polymorph forming in the case of the anatase in the milling conditions we used. SCM hints to changes in the way in which the particles are arranged, and this is also hinted by other complementary analysis we performed, including using nitrogen absorption uh, analysis. So we decided to investigate using O17 NMR, the final materials, and this is what you get. After one ever go of milling, in the case of the aerosol, you get a signature which is characteristic mainly of siloxane bridges. And in the case of anatase, you have a signature which is characteristic of OTI3 environments, such as those you would find in the bulk of the anatase phase. So very clearly, the labeling has been successful. Again, within these measurement times, in absence of labeling, we would not have had any signal in O17 NMR. And more importantly, it's actually very fast. And using complementary analysis, we were able to show that in addition to these siloxane and OTI3 environments, there are also a small amount of uh, silanols and TIOH groups, which can be made evidence. And using complementary analysis, we were able to show that not only the surface, but also part of the bulk is enriched in O17. So now we have these particles uh, and these precursors enriched in O17. Let's study the mixture of the two to try to answer the question regarding the interface. And we decided to perform three types of reactions, starting with one of the precursors labeled in O17, the other, or both. The reactions were performed by what we call dry milling over just three minutes at 25 hertz. And first, we will focus on the first system. And you have here, a comparison of the X-ray diffraction powder pattern of the anatase precursor and of the mixture we obtain. And after just three minutes of milling, you see that the signature we get is actually the sum of this precursor and an amorphous background, which corresponds to the amorphous silica precursor. No new crystalline phase is detected by powder X-ray diffraction. That's not fully surprising because it's just three minutes of milling. However, we have absolutely no information from this analysis regarding the environments at the interfaces. So now let's look at the O17 NMR data. Here you have the signature of the titania precursor I showed previously before milling. And here you have the signature of the mixture after three minutes of milling. So as expected, there is still this OTI3 environment which is visible. However, very interestingly, we have a new signal which appears here which is actually characteristic of the siloxane bridges. So to be able to get a signal here, that means this part of the particles got enriched in O17. So some of the enriched oxygens within the three minutes of milling have actually been transferred to the silica phase. And we looked in more detail at the spectra because we were curious about the presence of this pump here which is typically in the region we would expect for TIOSI bridges. And so we turned to another magnetic resonance related techniques, which allow us to look into more detail at sites which are close to the surface of particles, and this is called dynamic nuclear polarization. And by using this technique, we were able to boost the sensitivity of this middle signal on the NMR spectra and demonstrate that it includes partly the signature of SIOTI bridges. And through complementary studies of these other mixtures with one or the other component enriched in O17, we performed the similar type of NMR analysis, including in the region around 200 ppm, which is shaded in gray here. And we're able to demonstrate that we have resonances which seem to be characteristic of these SIOTI bridges. So the interesting point here is that we were able to show that after just three minutes of milling, there are actually very fast bond rearrangement, which have occurred between the oxide particles. 
and this would not have been made evident by powder X-ray diffraction. Also, um, it's only thanks to O17 NMR labeling and to very large ranges of chemical shifts that we were able to demonstrate the presence of these interfacial bonds. Based on these different studies, um, we've been performing additional enrichment uh, synthesis of a, a variety of organic and inorganic compounds to try to understand in more detail um, the reaction mechanism occurring between uh, different compounds in the solid state. And the different labeling procedures are being developed together with Thomas Xavier Metro and Montpellier. So this was a first example as to how, as chemists, we can propose way to understand better what's going on within the milling media by really looking at the local environment of some of the atoms which are involved in the breaking and the formation of chemical bonds between the reacting particles. Let's now switch to the second part of the presentation, which focuses on studies we've been performing to understand in more detail what's going on in real time. And the work I will show today has been led by César Leroy, a colleague of mine in Montpellier, who has been studying using acoustics uh, what's going on inside some of the milling jar. In terms of synthesis, we'll now switch to another family of compounds, which are co-crystals made of terephthalic acid and DAPCO, which is this cyclic amine-related molecule. By milling them together, you can form a co-crystal which we, which is in which you have a transfer of one of the protons from the terephthalic acid to the DAPCO, and the other is also deprotonated to the other side. This co-crystal can be characterized by a variety of techniques, including by Raman spectroscopy. And here you have the signatures of the co-crystal at the bottom and the two precursors at the top. And because these signatures are very distinct, we can then use in situ operando Raman analysis of the reaction medium by mechanochemistry to study the kinetics of this transformation. So this is what we did in Montpellier. It's our setup. You have here a jar made of PMMA, which is transparent to our Raman beam. The Raman beam is focusing the beam at the inner, inner position of the, of, the, of the milling jar. And then you perform your, your, react, your reaction by measuring in real time the Raman signal. Schematically, um, this is our Raman beam. And I just wanted to add that we're also monitoring in real time the external temperature of the jar simultaneously. So here are the results. For this reaction, we perform the milling at 50 hertz. You have the milling time, which is shown here, over an hour on the vertical axis. Here you have the Raman data, and on the left, the temperature. At the beginning of the reaction, you only see the signature of the reagents. Focusing here just, I focused here just on the region between 900 and 1100 wave numbers. So the signature of the reagents up to about 1000 seconds. Then there's a shift. And then starting at around 1600 seconds, you have the signature of the co-crystal. So very clearly by Raman spectroscopy, we're observing the formation of an intermediate phase, which then leads to the final product. Interestingly, the formation of this phase is related to an increase in temperature inside the jar, which is measured experimentally. And uh, it increases by more than 10 degrees as shown here on this graph. And it turns out that while César was performing the experiments, he realized that there were changes in sound occurring during the reaction, repeatedly at the same time points when the reactions were being performed. If you want to listen to the soundtrack, you can then refer to this link uh, uh, in, in the recording of this uh, presentation. So we decided to add a microphone in our Bormillion setup. Typically, this is now our Bormillion setup in Montpellier where you have the instrument with the Perspex jar and the P23 mixer mill, the thermal imaging camera pointing towards the mixer mill, the Raman spectrometer with the Raman probe, and the microphone. And here you have the sound, which was recorded after Fourier transform in the frequency range between 4, 145 and 160 hertz. 
the intensity of the sound going towards this direction. Very interestingly, what we observe is that when we have this increase in temperature, when we have this intermediate phase, we actually have an increase in the sound precisely in this region. And to our knowledge, it's the first time that changes in acoustic are actually correlated to the presence of a, an intermediate chemical compound. So can we go one step further? So the idea here is that we were performing analysis in which we had the Raman, the temperature, and the sound. However, in some milling reactions, we can't use jars which are made of PMMA like the one shown here. We have to use stainless steel jars. That means that we won't be able to use Raman spectroscopy. So will the sound be good enough for us to know if the, temp if the reaction is over? So to try to answer this question, we turned towards another type of reaction, which is the hydrolysis of activated fatty acids, which we had been studying in terms of oxygen-17 isotopic labeling. When you perform this hydrolysis step, in the case of a molecule like lauric acid, it turns out that you have a change in physical state of the compound, which start, goes from a powdery state to a more oily state. So we suspected that it would be possible to monitor this by recording the sound of the reaction medium. And so this is what we did. We performed the sound measurement of the activated lauric acid during the hydrolysis to form this imidazolium laureate. And you have the results shown here, where on one hand, you have the intensity of the sound recorded between the 205 to 245 hertz region. And on the other hand, you have the temperature as a function of time. And after approximately 2,000 seconds, we observed that there were no longer any changes in sound. And when you perform the analysis after those time points, then it turns out that the reaction is complete. So very clearly, this demonstrates that it is possible now to also use sound to try to follow the course of mechanical chemical reactions. And this is potentially interesting in cases when it will not be possible to use these stainless, these um, transparent PMMA jars, but when you have opaque jars, such as those made of stainless steel. So this wraps up what I wanted to present today. I just went through two examples of some of the instrumental developments and isotopic labeling approaches we've been using to try to understand better reaction mechanisms in wall milling. But there is a large amount of work also being performed in terms of computational modeling, and all these three must and should be developed together to go towards a better understanding of these reactions, which are being pushed forward because they are more environmentally friendly. And with this, I'd like to thank again a number of colleagues who have been working with me on these different projects, and I'd be happy to take a, a few questions. Thank you very much. We have a few questions today. First of all, you mentioned that the TiO2 was crystalline while the silica was amorphous. Does the degree of crystallinity affect the process or resolution in any way? Uh, yes. Um, it's very important. Um, okay. Um, in terms of the isotopic labeling, the nature of your starting oxide is very important and we had chosen a titania phase which is actually actually made of very small crystallites which are 10 to 20 nanometers and which are all agglomerated and this crystalline titania had a large surface area above 100 square meters per gram the reason to this is because you have the large surface area you'll have more surface sites which will be able to react with the labeled water, and then you will have the isotopic labeling. We have shown that if you start with more crystalline oxides, you can have less labeling in the end. And then one of the reasons to this is that they won't have the same physical chemical reactivity at their surfaces. So um, you, you must, yes, the, I think the important point is, um, the nature of the starting material will have an impact on the extent of isotopic labeling you get. And you have to be careful that your starting material after the milling leads to a material which you consider is good enough for whatever you want to do afterwards. Um, because we know the milling process maybe will agglomerate your particles or create other things between 
between the species. So you have to make sure you characterize your final material and uh, you consider that it is good enough for your subsequent steps. All right, thank you. Here's another one. Transfer of a 17 oxygen from TiO2 to SiO2 was observed after only three minutes of ball milling. If grinding is prolonged, is there any evidence for an equilibrium amount of oxygen transfer? We never reached the equilibrium. Uh, we, we didn't prolong to the point um, uh, where we could potentially have reached it because when we prolonged the milling after a while, under the conditions we had tested, we actually observed a phase transformation of uh, the anatase to one of the other polymorphs. So um, in that particular example, uh, we can't go towards a full equilibration. Would it be possible for other mixtures of oxides? I don't know because um, um, it's really a case by case uh, question which would need to be asked. Um, it's always a trade-off. How long do you want to mill your, your mixture considering that when you mill, you may also create other phases, or you may progressively introduce impurities from the milling jar. And um, how much um, scrambling of the oxygen bonds do you want to get? So um, I can't give a general answer to that, but in the specific case of silica plus titania, we weren't able to go towards a full transfer of the oxygen between the two purposes. All right, thank you. Here's another one. When doing isotopic labeling with 17 oxygen on MO2 and SiO2, why do you use only one molar equivalent of the 17 oxygen labeled H2O, water? <laughs> More equivalents could be beneficial for multiple reasons. Um, it's, we had to start somewhere. So it's going to be a very simple question. Uh, obviously, if you put more equivalents, you can introduce a uh, more isotopic label. Um, we just uh, wished to keep it to, to that number, and it allowed us to stay in the liquid-assisted grinding regime as well. So uh, we didn't go further in that specific case. For other reactions, we've used more equivalents of enriched water. But it's a good point. All right, let's do just one more. Does applying force in any way alter the reaction trajectory across the energy landscape? Does the reaction proceed through the same transition state as the thermal reaction? I don't think we can give a general answer to that because it will really depend on what your reaction is. Um, there, there are examples where um, the outcome of the ball milling reactions are quite different from those of more standard uh, solution-based chemistry reactions. So um, I don't know if it's just a question of because we're applying a force. I think we also have to bear in mind that there, there are also the physical chemical properties of the particles we're mixing that will take place and that will play a role on the outcome of the reaction and their surface reactivity and points like that, which are generally not considered when you're doing solution-based chemistry. All right, excellent. Well, thank you again for that presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawanson, for that. So, 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 so. And thank you for joining us. <laughs> Cue your it's sound as well. We've had a great group of speakers so far. <laughs> Danielle, that was one. Can you hear me now? This is the first time we've had yeah, okay. four that rows so of good, pictures. Yes, Quint, sorry, we hope that you will check out all of the previous <laughs> excellent great. seminars. Yeah. Again, they're on the that was, that was such a great presentation. It was so we clear and engaging and really wonderful. I hope you will join us for all of them. Okay, thank you. Thank you.